AI is going to take over all the jobs in the economy. It will be the end of work. Captain of industry, I think two weeks ago, said 50% yeah. of the workforce is going to be out of jobs in 10 years. Yeah. Technically, what he said was 50% of entry-level knowledge jobs will be gone in five years. It turns out it's about 20 days of U.S. normal job loss. Every day in the U.S., people lose their jobs. A, that's how you get a thing in the newspaper or a, t a TED Talk or whatever. You know, if, if you say, well, you know, there'll be some job loss and nobody cares. People who pontificate about that, like you and me, we're not working with our hands. You know, we're knowledge jobs. Knowledge jobs are a little more susceptible, let's say, particularly routinized knowledge jobs like law clerks. But most jobs aren't like that. Um, they, they do require way more complexity. So I'm not worried at all about AI taking jobs. Welcome to Sampro TV. Today, we're delighted to have Professor Robert Atkinson, the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. The foundation is shaping the debate and setting the agenda on a host of critical issues at the intersection of technological in innovation and public policy. Professor Atkinson has advised the past five U.S. administrations on public policy, both Republican and Democrat. Thank you so much for joining me today, Professor Atkinson. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate uh, you having me back. Uh, it, it's really amazing that you you have literally advised all the administrations, uh, you know, since President Clinton. I'm not sure if you did push the father, but I think I saw that you you've been a fixture, uh, you know, telling you know American administrations how to work on policy. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, if if I, if my area of expertise was uh, energy policy or health policy or social policy. I, I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have had that opportunity. The thing about technology policy is that it tends to be less partisan. Uh, each, both both parties, both kinds of administration, they want to advance innovation and technology and American competitiveness. So um, you know that helps. Uh, it's easy. You don't have to be pigeonholed as a Republican analyst or a Democratic analyst. You can play it down the middle of the road as we do. That's great. And, you know, I think it's I guess it's good for us that, you know, you're you know, that this kind of expertise can be helpful to both sides of the aisle. Um, and you're not you know, you, you get to eat no matter who's in the, you know, in Congress or in the White House, so to speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, you wrote a book. Uh, you co-authored a book uh, last year that, I, that, that you know, I want to talk about. It was really fascinating. And I believe it, it, it's a uh, Technology fears and scapegoats. Forty myths about privacy, jobs, AI, and today's innovation economy with David Mashella. And uh, you know, I thought you know we could probably talk for hours on that, but unfortunately, I can't take up that much of your time. Um, but you know, it's it's so funny. I, I read through it, and I really appreciate. I mean, I, I consume a tremendous amount of media, and I've fallen prey to some of the platitudes that um, that, you know, that that have been written. And I reminded your book reminded me of Reagan's famous quote. He said, "And and this is again meaning nonpartisan, but liberals aren't ignorant. It's just so that." They know so much that isn't so. And one of the things I, I wanted to ask you to explain is we always hear that small business, the lifeblood of the economy, and how it is, um, creates the most jobs. And it turns out that's not really true. Yeah, you know, to your major point, what, what's striking about the narratives, and not just in the U.S., but in many, many countries, is the sort of you get you get these accepted wisdoms, uh, and they get get getting repeating repeated. So nobody ever goes back and says, "Well, wait a minute, is it actually true or not?" And that's what David and I tried to do in this book. And with regard to small business, you're absolutely right. Every every president, you know, small business is is the anchor. And by the way, to be clear, as we say in the book, this is not an argument to say that small is bad and big is good. It's just, it's an argument to say, let's just be neutral. Let's be pragmatic. We, we shouldn't be sort of putting the thumb on one scale, but small businesses, they, again, on average, uh, they pay less. They have fewer benefits for their workers. They injure their workers more. They lay them off more. Uh, they're less likely to do our research and development. You just go down the list on every single indicator. They're not as good because they don't have the resources and the capabilities. And then you say, well, wait, what, what, what about job creation? Um, there was a good study by uh, several academic economists, and they found that to create um, th th that the, the median number of jobs that a company has, a new startup, after like 10 years is like one. Because most small companies, most startup companies fail. 
So it's kind of like a revolving door. We say, oh, look at how they created all these jobs. They did create all these jobs, but you don't look at net jobs. Well, yeah. So Fred and Sally opened up a little shop, but uh, Don and Mary's shop closed down. Well, we you got to look at both of those things. So it turns out when you really look at it, small business is responsible for slightly more than the amount they have. Like, so that's, they're about 47 percent of jobs they're responsible for maybe 48 percent although to be fair in the last five years it's been the opposite it's in big business has been creating slightly more jobs so it's just one of those things where i think the whole the whole argument sort of just got off base it's like oh small 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 and in reality large corporations are critical to the you know to the health of any economy uh doesn't matter what kind of economy in fact one of the things you can tell if you want to know the single sort of single best indicator of how poor a country is rather than looking at per capita income, is what share of uh, employment is in sell, is self-employment. Oh. So, yeah. So you look at a country like, you know, I don't know, Zaire or some of these con- poor countries in Africa, you got 75%, 80% of people self-employed. <laughs> Those are subsistence wages. Those are, you know, you know, the countries that are rich are where you have many, many people employed in large companies because they're highly productive. Uh, it was one of those myths that was fun to pop. It, it, you know, it's fascinating because I guess uh, certainly in the U.S. we have this almost worship, if not idolatry, of entrepreneurship. And, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the person who goes out and stakes his claim, and there's a tremendous amount of survivorship bias. We only hear about the people yeah. who survive and, and make it really big. Uh, yeah. and, you, know, it, you know, that indicator is really a, a fascinating one that, you know, the more self-employed it is, in general, actually perhaps the poorer the economy happens to yeah. be. But yeah. we're on the subject of jobs, and here's something that we're, we've been deluged with over the past couple of years: is you know AI is going to um, you know, basically take over all the jobs in the economy. It will be the end of work, um, and I think that you had that as myth twenty five, and you know, you sort of put the kibosh on that quite effectively. So do, should we not worry about AI as much as some people say? You know, fifty percent of that workforce, some. Captain of industry, I think two weeks ago, said 50% yeah. of the workforce is going to be out of jobs in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, technically, what he said was 50% of the entry-level knowledge jobs will be gone in five years. And then I wrote, a, I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal that I, I calculated what that is. And if you took all those jobs, you eliminated half of them, you divide by five to get a yearly number. It turns out it's about 20 days of U.S. normal job loss. Every day in the U.S., people lose their jobs. The company downsizes, the company closes. Not great. Oh, and by the way, that rate today is the lowest it's been since 1995, which is completely opposite. Everybody thinks, oh, the employment market is so disruptive. You just, you know, you're going to lose your job. Well, no, actually, it's been slowly becoming more stable. But anyway, the reason why I think all that is just vastly overblown is. A, that's how you get a thing in the newspaper or a, t- a TED talk or whatever. You know, if, if you say, well, you know, there'll be some job loss and nobody cares. But the other factor is people, I was talking to the CEO of a big AI company recently, not as big as some of the big ones, but pretty big. Oh, you 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 got to see what we're seeing. And I'm like, yeah, because you're selling a particular service for a particular function to a particular type of company. And I get it. Within that, yeah, there's going to be a lot of efficiencies, but you're not selling to the fire department. You're not selling to the local guy who puts up drywall. You know, there's just so many jobs that are just hard to do, and AI won't do them. Not in not for a long, long, long time, and and people just sort of forget that. The other reason why is people who pontificate about that, like you and me. I mean, look at you, look at me. You know, we're not working with our hands. You know, we're we're knowledge jobs, and. Uh, you know, their knowledge jobs are a little more susceptible, let's say, particularly routinized knowledge jobs like law clerks. Yeah. But most jobs aren't like that. Um, they, they do require there's way more complexity. So I'm not worried at all about AI taking jobs. I think the other the problem will be if they don't take enough because U.S. labor productivity growth is so slow. And we've got to raise productivity to help with the national debt, to help with the big baby boom crisis. With the, So I, I think the whole argument is, flawed and the the last point i'll make is it, it, it's problematic because it scares people right if you if you right. really believe that your kids aren't going to get a job when they graduate from college and they're gonna have to live in your basement for 20 years you're like hey man let's slow this thing down <laughs> um 
you know, I, I wanted to get this. Uh, I, you brought something up, productivity, and I, I think I've been, I read. I'm not sure if it's in one of your other uh, commentaries that you know, productivity er, uh, times of high productivity actually lead to a substantial period of happiness there after. Um, and in that case, we do we do what productivity is good. And I will tell you that AI has made me personally more productive when I, you know, I have to look something up instead of spending a day doing it. Yeah. So three minutes on perplexity. Exactly. Exactly. And you still have a job. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, yeah. I have a job and I use AI. It, it, it makes our so there's a, that's the other thing about AI. a lot of it will be not all of it. But a lot of it will be what what economists call complement complementary complementarity. It just makes your it makes your ability to do a better job a little bit quicker, a little bit higher quality. You know, that's all to the good. Um, there was something I, just a slightly off on a tangent, but you mentioned something um, about universal basic income, and and I think I think that's an idea that when it first came about, it was, you know, it was disregarded as ridiculous. And, you know, I, I want to say there might be one principal, one municipality in the U.S. who might be trying it, but it's, it's the Overton window seems to have shifted and people think, well, you know, maybe with AI, you know, UBI, universal basic income, you know, we will need it because people want everything to do. And you had some interesting comments about UBI. If you, you know, why is it so that? I, I have to be polite, uh, so I won't give my rant as to why that is <laughs> one of the worst ideas in human history. But in seriousness, there's two reasons why that's a bad idea. <clears throat> um, we already have AI; it's coming. We have the lowest unemployment rate we've had in 30 years. So wake me when we get to 12 percent unemployment, and the Fed tries everything it can do, and we don't bring it down. Then, then let's have a conversation about it. That's not going to happen. We're not going to get to 12% unemployment. The Fed won't allow it. There's just no evidence that, that high productivity technologies lead to high unemployment. In fact, the evidence shows that there's no relationship, believe it or not. And the reason there's no relationship is, hey, if, if you're now, you know, I don't know, you're doing something and, and, and or you're, you're buying something that's built, built with AI and it, it costs less, so you don't put your money under the rock in the back of your house. you like, I'm going to spend money on something else and that creates jobs. So that's number one. And just, we're not going to need it. But number two, I don't want to live in a world like that where you have, uh, you know, 10% of the people who are engaged in productive, meaningful activity. And then we got 90% of the proletariat given basically welfare and handouts. And, and what kind of society is that Do people, where people don't have meaning in life? And then the third thing is, where, how are you going to afford that? You know, you're going to give me universal basic income and you because we're not low income. Well, who's paying for that? Somebody's got to pay for that. Uh, and and the, the finances are just simply are just they're, they're just nonsensical. There's no way to afford universal basic income. Uh, you know, I I think you're absolutely right. Like, you know, do you, you want to have a reason to get up in the morning and I don't yeah. know about you, but I don't really like golf and I'm actually quite terrible at it. Maybe there's yeah. a correlation there. But yeah. I like to get up and have a reason to, you yeah. know, to do what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but it, it's become, you know, one of those things where, like, you, people say, oh, isn't it great? But it'll just be another hand now. And, well, since modern monetary theory seems to be on the outs at the moment, you're absolutely right. And, you know, how can we, you know, how can we actually afford it? Yeah. Um, I would um, just say one other thing, by the way. Yeah, MMT, man. Oh, my God. what a, That was almost as dumb as... Uh, I wouldn't be political, but the idea of that if you cut taxes, you're going to raise more money, the Laffer curve, that curve only works at certain levels. You know, when you're down in the 40s or 50s, it doesn't work anymore in the rates. But I think the key point here is I could see a world in 15, 20 years where maybe because of AI based productivity, maybe we move the work week down to 30 hours a week and we get four weeks vacation. That seems pretty good to me. But yeah, you, I, think I could work with that. Yeah, we can all work with it. We go, hey, this is great. But the idea that we're going to run out of things to buy and run out of things to do is just nonsensical. Human needs are very, very, uh, very, very uh, um, elastic. Uh, you know, I always joke that if I had way more money, uh, I'm six foot seven. You can't tell from the video. If I had way more money, I would never fly coach again for the rest of my life. It would never, ever happen because I hate flying coach because I get crammed in there. But I don't because I don't have unlimited amount of money and I want to spend it on other things or save for retirement or whatever. So I'm not worried about it.
six foot seven is a little tough to fly and coach. I think yeah. perhaps you should you should you should buy some private equity along with the uh, administration. They can afford to fly you a little bit. It's a really good, really good, really good idea. <laughs>